But we begin tonight talking about your health. Joining us to answer your questions about diabetes and diabetes prevention is Dr. Alexandra Moran, the Diabetes Program Director at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Let's start with some definitions. Diabetes, I'm thinking about blood sugar, correct? Yes. Difference between type one and type two. So diabetes is basically your pancreas not working. When you have type one, it means that the pancreas is not producing any insulin. And when you have type two, is that you're not producing enough insulin. And there, there's a, a vast difference between the incidence of type one and type two. Correct, yes. Um, and type one is mostly associated with um, children. And um, when it comes to type two, it's usually in adults, although nowadays we keep seeing it at a younger and younger age. What is pre-diabetes? So pre-diabetes is when your blood sugar is high, but not high enough to be diabetic, to be diagnosed with diabetes. To, um, to check the blood sugar, um, I guess obviously a blood test, there can be a urine test as well. And, and how does it work? I mean, do you need to be fasting? You, you shouldn't head to the Baskin Robbins right before. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, nowadays we do have a couple of different tests. One of them is fasting glucose, uh, which, you know, you fa fast uh, uh, hours before, usually the night before you stop, and then you get tested in the morning. Um, but really what gives us a better window is the A1C, which is, um, glycosylated hemoglobin where what it is really is that it measures the coating of the red blood cells. So think about it like a donut, a glazed donut. So donut is the red blood cell and the glaze is the sugar in here. So we measure that. And the good thing about that is that it gives us a window longer than your fasting, which is a, a, a standing a minute that we see when you're seeing when you're seeing the fasting glucose. So in A1C, what we see is a kind of an like average between three months of how you've been eating. So even though you might skip Baskin Robbins <laughs> and ice cream and pizza the night before, we're gonna know if you've been eating pizza and ice cream before. Yeah, my dental hygienist can can tell also whether <laughs> no matter how vigorously I brush my teeth exactly. uh, uh, that recently. How many people have these conditions and and don't know it? So. It's like 19 million people in the U.S., 80% don't know it. In Maryland specifically, we have 12.6% that have diabetes, and about 37% have prediabetes. And then again, these are uh, numbers with people that have gone to their doctor, have gotten tested. Most people are not aware that they have prediabetic condition. And there's some risk in that, right? You you Correct. want to be aware. Yes, you do want to be aware. So being pre-diabetic doesn't necessarily mean you are going to end up being diabetic, but it, it gives you a window where you can take action to prevent diabetes, uh, to prevent all the side effects, to pre prevent complications, and you can really turn the corner and just live a healthy life. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about diabetes or pre-diabetes, you can give us a call at the number on the screen or send us an email right now to livequestions at mpt.org. Now, what is the Baltimore Metropolitan Diabetes Regional Partnership? That's a mouthful. It's now called Healthier Together. It's a partnership that we have. Uh, it's a grant funded. And uh, we have a partnership with the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins. So we're really focused on Baltimore City and preventing and managing diabetes. Let's talk about the, the prevention part. How, if somebody's on this path, how can you interrupt it? So there's a couple of things that you need to consider when we're talking about prediabetes and diabetes prevention. Uh, healthy eating and exercise are, are the key. We uh, have a problem at uh, a program at University of Maryland where uh, we give you all the tools you need to succeed doing this. So we teach you about carbs, we teach you about calories, about reading labels and how much you're supposed to eat and you know when you can have that cake at a party and what can you do to not spike your glucose. Um, so we really do invest in the, in the participants and the patients for a year long process and where we go with you, you have group support. And, and again, we take a very holistic approach to this. We try to make sure that you succeed in this program. So we have 
uh, we address the social determinants of health that we hear a lot when it comes to healthcare, right? So if you can't uh, make our appointment, we try to help you to get transportation there. Uh, we have food access, we have uh, mental health. So again, it's a very holistic approach to diabetes. How often are you successful? Which has got to be hugely rewarding. But I'm thinking about the, you know, the societal cues that, that lead people to eating badly. They may live in a, a food desert. There may not be great uh, access to, to uh, veggies and, and fruits and fruit juices and everything. Um, and at the same time, you know, all the, uh, the fast food joints are advertising all the time. Correct. Um, well, that's what we learn in the program, right? We teach you when we have to go to certain fast foods, what, you, what choices you can make to reduce that calorie intake or to re or have a, just a better option. Um, and then also during all of these classes that we have, we teach you on how you can access all this information, how you can go to uh, get food that's healthy, how to uh, make really a behavioral change. Um, and I know that's asking a lot, but really noticing the difference and how this impacts uh, the outcomes to, become, to prevent diabetes. Uh, there's a study that followed about 3,000 patients uh, for about eight years in which they had a placebo group, uh, a group that they gave medicine to, uh, metformin, and another group where they had uh, the classes. And 50, uh, the, the people that had uh, the classes uh, for the diabetes prevention program reduced their risk by 51% compared to the metformin, which was just about 30. So even if you do have diabetes and you take uh, medication, really what's gonna make the most impact is gonna be the behavioral change. Let's take a phone call from Baltimore City. This is Mark. Mark, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my question is about coffee. Um, I'll just say I'm not a diabetic now, uh, but uh, there has been diabetes in my family. Um, my grandmother had type two and she lived with it for 30 years. So I'm just wondering, I'm wondering about coffee. Uh, I've understood that coffee lo uh, sort of tamps down or lowers your blood sugar. But of course, caffeine has other effects that some people, you know, that our studies indicate are negative. We'll get you I'm an answer. What the doctor would say. Mark, thank you coffee. for calling. Coffee, decaf, regular. Well, caffeine affects your sleep, and by affecting your sleep, you affect different hormones like cortisol, which do increase and decrease depending on how you do it. Um, your your insulin and your you know the whole array of what it is diabetic. But in particular, when it comes to coffee, it depends how you take it, right? If you take it with cream, if you take it with sugar, if you take it black, that's what we really want to focus on. And I always say, if that's your treat for the day, have it, but then make sure that you eat right the rest of the day. Can you reverse diabetes if somebody has type two or almost type two and you, and you do all these things, have you, have you seen a remission? Is that a thing? So when you have been diagnosed, it's not like you can revert the diagnosis, but you can definitely revert to being completely uh, under control. So you can definitely control it and even live a healthy life without medication. You will just always have to make sure that you keep checking your, your glucose or your A1C. Your A1C. Um, email question, when the blood test comes back, what line do you look at to see if you have a diabetes problem? You want to look at your glucose uh, and you want to look at your A1C results. Uh, you always want to stay between, uh, when you're pre-diabetic, you are between 100 and 125. And when it comes to A1C, you want to stay within uh, below 5.6. You know, somebody just wrote in with those similar numbers. Can your pancreas be damaged if your A1C stays at 6.4 or 6.3? I am pre-diabetic due to the statins I take for cholesterol, uh, the viewer writes. Right, so um, that's, a comp that's, a, that's a particular a question there, yeah, yeah. Uh, that you should definitely go back to your physician, to your primary care physician to address. Uh, but yes, there is diabetes caused by certain medication, um, but you can't control it. And your pancreas, uh, again, if you put it to overwork by not eating healthy, by being sedentary, not really working out, uh, you're not helping him. You're not helping your, your pancreas, right? Um, even if you have a, a, a medication that is affecting it, you wanna be able to kind of put it at ease 
by eating correctly and by exercising to help him out. I uh, refer we, as him, I don't know why. <laughs> we, we mentioned family before. How often do, is there a genetic component to it? There's, it's very strong, and it's, uh, it's something that you can definitely avoid, meaning that, for example, everybody on my dad's side of the family, everyone has diabetes. So I have a very strong genetic predisposition to get it. However, it doesn't mean I'm going to end up there. It means that I need to take control and that I need to take these classes and that I need to make sure that I, don't, that I, ha I stay active, that I eat healthy, and that I don't necessarily want to end up you know, be becoming a diabetic. It's up to me. And that's why this particular job really appeals to you? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Let's talk about treatment a little bit. For, for people who have diabetes, um, everybody knows about insulin. What's changed in, in recent years with the, the ability to, to tightly control somebody's blood sugar? So there's a lot of different tools now that we have. You know, you know, have the, the monitors that you can keep a more close look into what you're eating, how your uh, glucose spikes, how insulin is dispensed before you used to just stick yourself every day. Now you have a pretty much an attached dispenser in your body. Um, but then again, it, it has a very big component on how you eat and again, exercise. I, mean, I know I keep going back to that, but so uh, we have a DSMT, which is a diabetes self-management training, which we teach you specifically that when you have diabetes, how to manage it. How, because you don't, when you have diabetes, you don't want to get those complications. You don't want to end back in our, uh, and back in our ER, right? You wanna stay home, eat healthy, exercise, and control it. And you can always, again, go back to not having to need medication. We, we should focus on the, the, the complications that, that can happen with uncontrolled diabetes or, or even partially controlled diabetes over time. What, what do you most worry about? There's a couple of things. I always say that uh, diabetes is, is, a silent, is a silent killer because you don't really feel necessarily completely bad. And especially when it, we're talking about prediabetes, you don't have really signs and symptoms. When you are diabetic, you don't feel awful. You have diabetes and then you go about your life. But diabetes is there, is there making damage. So when you have damage that has been done for 10, 20 years, then it's when you see the complications like, complications, renal failure, uh, your liver, your nerves, your arteries, uh, you start losing sights, you, um, you know, amputations, those are all complications, very long term though. But critical things to avoid if you possibly can, it's, exactly. it's getting somebody focused on that at a younger age. What, what age ranges are we talking about? So it's, it, nowadays it really it starts so young. We keep seeing it younger and younger. I mean, diabetes has been an uh, epidemic in the United States in 1994. Uh, so at, now with the whole lifestyle we do, you know, fast food, working so much and being on a desk instead of uh, being active, uh, the age really starts to come down to teenagers even. Um, so it's everywhere from teenagers all the way to 60. The risk though, it's over 42. You are at more risk if you're obese if you have you know, gen uh, genetic predisposition, if you're African-American and Hispanic or Latino. Uh, viewer uh, writes to ask, uh, please suggest a diet for somebody who has borderline blood sugar but not yet diabetic. So pre-diabetes. Um, a diet is not necessarily something I love to recommend because what we wanna encourage is not for you to do a, a trendy diet for a month or two, lose the weight and then gain it back up. We want you to make behavioral changes, changes that are gonna last uh, a lifetime. So we teach you on, you know, maybe reduce a little bit of carbs. If you're gonna have cake, if you wanna have pizza one day, it's okay. Make sure you exercise a little bit more that week. Make sure you have a little lighter lunch or lighter dinner. So that's what we wanna focus on, not really a, a, a fad diet. Uh, speaking of fads, uh, weight loss drugs are, are in the news. A lot. Um, do they figure into your practice? Um, yes and no. When it comes to pre diet it, it really depends on the patient if they want to go uh, that route. I, I encourage it if you're up for it and you want to take the, 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 the needle. <laughs> uh, for I think it's a good adjuvant care. I think it's a parallel. I, it's not going to fix because once you stop taking it, you're going to go back. So if you don't make those behavioral changes, if you don't make those lasting changes, you're just gonna fall back into it. 
How about the impact, uh, speaking of drugs, of insulin itself, um, the, uh, the price cap that the, the federal government has, has worked out? Does it make that more, does it make treatment more accessible for people? It'll definitely make it more accessible, but we have such a vast uh, factors, demand. yeah, uh, factors and demands and everything that, I mean, but it'll definitely make it more available. Um, gestational diabetes, is that related to type one, type two? Yes, um, gestational diabetes is one of the risks. Like once you had it, uh, you're more likely to get it down the road. You're more likely to become uh, diabetic down the road. So that is definitely one of the risk factors that we take into consideration when we're talking about prediabetes. What, so what's the, the takeaway for our viewers? What, what should people, maybe they have a, a relative who, who has it, they've never thought about it much. What do you want people to do? Well, first, I want you guys to familiarize with the programs that we have to prevent diabetes. You can go to healthiertogether.org, and we explain really what the two programs that we offer and what you need to look out for. And once you call us, we'll guide you through. If we can see the results that you have, we'll let you know, hey, you're at risk, or hey, you're not at risk. Um, and then talk to your doctors, get tested, get your glucose checked, get your A1C tested, and make sure that you're within parameters. And if you're not, and if you have all these risk factors, make sure you join a, a program where you can prevent it. And uh, you serve the, the Baltimore area. Correct. But elsewhere, start with your primary care? Yes. Yes, start with primary care, yeah. Dr. Alexander Moran, Diabetes Program Director at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.